Good evening. My name is David Quick, Adult Services Coordinator with the DC Public Library. We welcome you to tonight's virtual author talk as we kick off the library's celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This is an exciting time for DC Library staff and volunteers, and we welcome you to go to our website at dclibrary.org slash AAPIHM and follow us on social media for more library events and resources this month. Tonight, we welcome Francis Kaihua Wong. Francis is a journalist, essayist, speaker, and poet focused on issues of diversity, race, culture, and the arts. She has a weakness for a well-crafted argument and a lyrical turn of phrase. Her latest work and the subject of tonight's discussion, You Cannot Resist Me When My Hair Is In Braids, is now available at over 20 branches here at DC Public Library. We are so glad to welcome her back to DCPL. Welcome, Francis. Leading tonight's conversation is Katherine Reynolds Lewis, an award-winning journalist, author, and speaker based in Washington, DC. Katherine writes and reports on topics including parenting, children, education, race, gender, and disability. She's the author of The Good News About Bad Behavior, also available here at the library. Katherine, thank you for leading tonight's discussion and take it away. Thank you so much, David, for that really kind introduction. Um, Francis Kai Hua Wong has written for so many places, I can't even mention them all, but certainly including PBS NewsHour, NBC Asian America, the Center for Asian American Media. Um, she has uh, created a multimedia artwork that was in the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. She's a Knights Arts Challenge Detroit artist. And her amazing book, which I highly recommend getting at the library or buying at your local independent bookseller, is the uh, You Cannot Resist Me When My Hair Is In Braids which deftly navigates the space between cultures and reflects on lessons learned from both Asian American elders and young multiracial children, punctuated by moments rich with cultural and linguistic nuance. So Francis, this remarkable book contains such a variety of styles, moods, and forms. I laughed, I teared up, I nodded in recognition the whole way through. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process and how you brought this collection together? Thank you so much, Catherine, for, uh, for being in conversation with me today. And thank you, MLK Library. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, in terms of writing process, I'm one of these people where I don't know what I think until I write it down. And so, a lot of times when I'm struggling with something or I'm going around in circles or I'm I, I'm just unhappy or I'm just confused or overly happy. I mean, you can go either way. Um, I often need to sit down and write it, write it. And then I realize what I think about it or how I feel. And so writing is my is my processing space. And I've written a lot uh, in many different styles, but I find uh, you know, there's work writing and there's journalism writing. Uh, I've, I was an essay. I am an essayist. I, you know, that's another kind of writing. But then there's really, really personal writing that, you know, that I, I don't know, uh, that just it doesn't fit in any of those other spaces. And so I, I would just write and write and it took me several years to figure out that this was an actual genre that this mm -hmm. was something that uh could be you know that could be a book even yeah absolutely and i'm and i'm curious how you came up with the structure of how the pieces fit together or you know how you think of them as a whole i'm always interested to hear how the pieces flow in the mind of the author mm -hmm. So, uh, so let me back up before this book a little bit. And uh, before I, I, I used to, I used to just write, right? And I didn't know what the form was. It wasn't quite a short story because there was no plot, and it wasn't poetry because it didn't really look like a poem, right? And I, I'm not very educated, you know. I didn't know what it was, and, but I just kept writing for years. And then one day I learned about this form 
called a prose poem. I'm like, wait a minute, maybe that's it. And I learned about flash fiction. I said, oh, maybe that's it. And I read and I read and I read just to try to understand what this possibility was. And this doesn't usually happen, but for me, once I had a genre, like I had a box to put it in. Usually boxes are restrictive, but for me, it was like, oh, so what I'm writing is legitimate. Oh, creative nonfiction, that was another box I learned. Yeah. About. And I was so amazed. And so I, I had an opportunity a few years ago. Uh, I had a friend who wanted to have an art show. And the, the he said, do you know any galleries who can you know show my work? And I was like, uh, sure. But they didn't know who he was. So they wanted me to be a part of it so that uh, people would come. And then I was like, well, he's going to be selling all these photos. I want to I want to have something, too. So I put together all my post poems that I've been writing for 20 years in a mm -hmm. chat book. Mm -hmm. See this. So I this remember is, that yeah. from when you and I first met. You had uh, that so the, these. Uh, yeah. And this is, you know, a, uh, what do you <clears throat> call it a hand printed cover, hand sewn binding. Uh, but I, I made it a chapbook so I could pull it together really quickly. And But it's got 20 years of writing and they're prose poetry. And I was really surprised that it hung together as a book in a way that it didn't hang together as individual pieces that I had mm -hmm. tried sending out to you know poetry journals and, and just nothing worked by itself. But as a book, it worked. Mm -hmm. And so three chapbooks later, uh, we're in the pandemic and uh, with the pandemic, you know, as a lot of people, everything stopped. So no more traveling, no more speaking engagements, no more, you know, work dried up. And so I finally had time to actually finish everything on my to-do list. It took, of course, from March to about November. <laughs> but around November, my to-do list was cleared off. And I thought, well, what am I going to do next? And I thought, oh, what about, why don't I see if I have enough poems uh, since the last chapbook to to put together a book. So I pulled together everything I'd written that hadn't been published in a book form yet. And, you know, I put it together. I said, like, well, is this a book? I rearranged the chapters. I found a few holes. I filled in the holes. And, uh, and during the pandemic, I'd also been asked to write a few pieces too. So I put those in and I sent it to Wayne State University Press. And they said, yes, this is a book. Thank you. <laughs> so, so it sounds like that that name, the the name of the form was sort of the permission almost that you needed to to move forward. Um, and I'm glad you did because I, as I said, so many themes that you write about are so relevant to me, you know, and and so many of the um, the the language and the experiences resonated, but especially the intergenerational issues, you know, sort of both peeking into your children's world and like overhearing their conversations with their friends and the way that they're processing the world, but then also the aunties and the mothers and sort of like the older generation. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you're situated and how you navigate sort of being in between those very different generations. Oh, how do I navigate? I, I'm still figuring that out. Uh, <laughs> you don't have the answer? <laughs> you have the answer. You're the parenting expert. You're the one I go to and I don't know what I'm doing, uh, which is every day. Uh, but I have I have uh, four children, uh, three daughters and a son. And I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm always listening. The, the best parenting tip, since I know we'll have a lot of parenting folks following you here, the best parenting tip I ever got was to drive the carpool, right? Any chance you get, drive. And uh, because while you're driving up front, the kids are in back talking, and that's when you learn all their secrets. Um, or at least you, you, you know, you hear names, who's who, what's going on. And I love that. And so, um, and so I try to, you know, listen and hang out. But the kids know, you know, they used to have competitions in middle school for, you know, who had the meanest Chinese mom or who had the meanest Asian mom. And I always lost those battles or those competitions. And uh, it's a good one to lose. <laughs> That's the one you, you want to lose. <laughs> and so I always lost those. Those, but I think the a lot of my kids' friends knew that if they had questions that they you know, especially with identity mm -hmm. things and Asian American things, they actually were, I want to say, you know, they, they would get exposed to 
Asian America and Asian American history, Asian American identity issues through us in a way that they didn't, you know, get it in school, right? Asian American history is not taught in, in high schools at all. So, uh, Although my yeah, daughter so, actually, my daughter's happy. actually taking Asian history. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> lucky. Yes. It's very lucky. Uh, but, but uh, you know, a lot of, how do I say this? Um, I feel like the, 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 the kids in our like extended circle are much cooler about Asian American stuff than uh, before we met them and before, and kids that we don't, you know, that sometimes I meet kids, I'm like, you don't know anything mm -hmm. about Asian America. Let me, let me see what I can do to help you out. Yeah, yeah. And so, and the kids know that they can come and ask questions too. Yeah. And, and, and it's, they, such a, yeah. it's such a global world, you know, like the kids in Detroit or Ann Arbor or DC are just as likely to be into K-pop or, you know, manga, which apparently I always say wrong, <laughs> according to my daughter, um, you know, uh, and so I think there's a lot more interest and accessibility than maybe when you and I were growing up and nobody, it was low main or chow main. <laughs> that was yeah. basically it, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Those so. are the best calls, the calls home from college. Like, you know, my roommate is seeing this guy. Is he an Asian file? And then she would like give us the clues, and and uh, you know, not just me because I'm I'm an adult, a little different. But and her the sis, the other siblings, and they would ask all of her once, like, is this is this person an Asian file? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> tell your <laughs> tell your friend to be a little careful. <laughs> um, and then and then what about the other piece well actually let's come back to the aunties later because i'm more interested in the sort of dating uh the the dating element that you you know brought up and this is one where where area where we differ i've been married um and monogamous for 21 plus years and so for me i love reading books like this that have like the juicy dating stuff and like navigating you know post divorce life trying to refigure out some of this um stuff so um but i imagine that's challenging to juggle while raising four kids and uh, you know can, can you talk a little bit about sort of how you opened that door for yourself or how it's maybe reflected how your work reflects that uh, new exploration yeah so I got married very very young too young and uh at the end of that marriage I you know I hadn't dated in a very long time and also with so many kids and kind of in the PTO world and, and, and a strong, I would say a heavily Asian American PTO world, I realized I hadn't even talked to a man that wasn't a teacher or a principal in like 10 years, oh right? Because like, at because at school functions, which is, you know, all I ever went to, school functions, it's all the moms, right? If there are dads, they're off in the corner talking with each other. And so it's not like we weren't allowed to or anything like that right it, it's just you know they're just not very interesting you know the dads are over there talking about dad stuff and the moms are the ones talking about the more you know not more interesting but more critical stuff like <laughs> deadlines and right. what do you need to bring and what <laughs> Which, how does this here's work? the hardest one and how to how to you know make sure that you're on the right side of the of the law <laughs> yeah all the you know all that stuff and so you know when you re suddenly realize you haven't talked to a man in 10 years, it was quite <laughs> shocking. And so I really had to relearn a lot of that. Like, how do you talk to people? But also relearn who I was. Cause you know, you, you change in different, uh, I want to say, you, you know, we all have roles and, and especially in an Asian American context, you know, you're the daughter, then you're the, you know, the wife, and then you're the mom. And then like, wait a minute, I, I totally missed one of these roles. Like this was not one of the roles that I had learned about as, or had that I had had on my progression of things. Um, so it was, it was not easy. I kind of like COVID. It just takes all the pressure off, right? <laughs> it's almost like in high school, I used to have friends that were like really upset when they couldn't get a date on a Friday night or something. But I was Asian American, so I wasn't allowed to date in high school. So there was none of that pressure or upset. 
Mm. And uh, now that it's COVID, it's like, great, I don't have to date anymore. Who mm -hmm. wants to date in COVID? <laughs> That's too terrifying. Um, I, and also, you know, it's interesting to me also having, being biracial myself, um, you know, I'm not the same race as my mom or my dad, right? They both, they have mono uh, racial identities. I have a multiracial identity and, you know, I'm in your family as well, right? You, you are positioned somewhat differently than your children. Um, you know, I'd be curious what you help them, how you help them navigate and maybe are there ways that you learn from them where you see them tackling a challenge or handling a situation in a way that maybe opens a door for you? Yeah. So I started writing uh, when, uh, how do I say this? So I, I, I started writing when I, at the, about the same time my second child was born. Well, I mean, I'd been writing, wait, 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 wait. I started writing for Asian American Village when my, after my second daughter was born. And I started writing a lot of parenting articles. And they were mostly, Asian American Village was one of, the, from I Am Diversity, used to be like one of the first Asian American digital magazines mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And I was a contributing editor. I wrote on a regular basis. And I, I wrote a lot about parenting, a lot about education. And, and mostly I wrote about the questions that I had, like how do you raise strong, uh, you know, strong Asian, strong and confident Asian American girls, right? How do you raise bilingual and trilingual children? How do you raise multiracial children? And it was great in terms of I would go like research, I'd interview people, and then I'd figure it out, and then yes. I'd write my article, and then uh, but everything is applied. Uh, and so one of the article, one of the things I read. Uh, no, no, no. One of the people I interviewed early on was uh, someone who's multiracial, but older than me. And so she, you know, comes from a different time, but she had a lot of, you know, really good perspectives. And I, what I realized was the key was not and that's when I realized my kids were multiracial, right? Yeah. And like part of it was realizing that their experience was different. Yeah. And and I needed to, you know, adjust that, right? And also to that we are not just, you know, Chinese by way of Taiwan, which is, you know, historically that's a very thin line, but the experiences of Japanese Americans affect us, the experience of Korean Americans affect us. The, experience of, you know, people who came in the railroad, you know, worked on the railroads, even though that has nothing to do with my family, because we came way later, it still affects us here in America. And so all of Asian American history belongs to us. And so I use, so my kids know this, they're a part of it, which yeah. is something I didn't realize when I was, you know, in, in college at all. I was like, well, the railroads that had nothing to do with me, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, so let's see. So, so a lot of it in terms of raising children that came through the writing, mm -hmm. and then later I wrote. I was an essayist, and I had a column, one of the few Asian American columns in the country that was was national. And in this, these columns, I wrote about you know, raising the kids with culture. Like we would go to this cultural event and what did we learn? And then we had this funny encounter with this person and what did we learn? And then we met this icon, what did we learn? You know, my kids have met all the Asian American icons and they're like so unimpressed by now just because they've <laughs> met everybody, they know, and everyone's met them um, and, and remember them, uh, but mostly as very little kids. So sometimes when they meet them now as bigger kids, it's, it's a shock. And That's then, so right, interesting. I, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, what was the last point? I had a, I had a really good answer. Um, are the there point. things that you learn from them? Oh yes, everything. I learn everything mm -hmm. from them because sometimes I find that you know, uh, my initial reaction is it comes from my experience of of growing up when you know it wasn't cool to be Asian and it wasn't you know, and and I catch myself sometimes. So I remember one time when my daughter was in first grade. No, no, no. It was earlier. It was preschool or kindergarten picture day. And it, her, it was right. For some reason, it was right after the Chinese New Year. 
And so she had her a new Chinese dress and it was picture day. And she's like, I'm going to wear my Chinese dress, my chi pa to picture day. And my first reaction was, oh, you can't do that, right? That you, The Chinese dress is only for Chinese New Year's. It's only for Chinese school. You don't wear that out into public, right? Because I grew up with a very strong right. divide. Home is home and public is public. And, uh, and then I, but I caught myself before I said anything and I like took a few moments and then I said, okay, if, if you really want to wear, are you sure, you know, do you really want to wear it? Are you okay with that? And I knew she went to a good, you know, her school was totally cool. They would be fine. And so I let her wear it and she was so happy and so beautiful too. And so yeah. that sort of thing happens again and again and again and again. And so the latest, I want to say the more, the older version of that story is, you know, I heard um, the kids were talking about how I, you know, know about a lot of different categories, but I have a few blind spots. And for some reason, I just don't know anything about it. And they think this is really strange because she knows about every, you know, a, a lot of things. And why doesn't she know anything about this issue and this issue? And so I slowly, I like, once I realized that this is a blind spot. So I asked the kids, you know, what is this about? How do I do this? Um, although sometimes it's embarrassing for them. The other, you know, especially when I'm trying to learn TikTok, that's the word. <laughs> they hate that. I'm, I'm banned. I'm not supposed to learn TikTok. Um, <laughs> yeah, that resonates so much for me. I remember at my wedding, we had a wedding that was like, you know, multiracial. And so we had um, actually it was Jewish Chinese wedding. So we had Chinese red yarmulkes that all the guests had. And um, and I, a friend of my husband's, um, who is a, an Asian American woman married to a white man, came up to me and said, you know, I just, I, you're so beautiful and happy. I hope for that for my girls. And I realized like, cause she had young biracial girls that she was hoping would grow into a world where they could celebrate every part of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to be careful not to let our fears and our, you know, traumas from, from the way we experience the world growing up to, to influence our, our kids or the next generation. We can't assume those things are, are going to carry through. And I remember this because there's a little girl living on our street in our neighborhood who is um, biracial, who's Indian American and, and Caucasian. And I have to, I catch myself wanting to warn her about like the things that I experienced, but her experience can be totally different. Right. And, and so we can be that resource while also not burdening the next generation with some of those bad experiences. Um, and, and, and when we can learn from them, you know, that's just such a privilege um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so some of the scenes and settings in, um, in You Cannot Resist Me When My Hair Is In Braids, I expected, right? I knew there would be something about Ann Arbor, maybe Taiwan, but there's so many other cities and locations that your work is set, you know, Kathmandu, India, airports on the threshold of a door. Um, and I'd love for you to explore a bit the role of place in your work and in this book in particular? Yeah, well, uh, so gosh, where to begin on that one? Uh, so I, I got married too young, as I said before, but I married an anthropologist and we went overseas and we lived in Kathmandu for four years. And so I you know, learned Nepali and I learned about Kathmandu and, uh, and always thought, you know, we would go back. And even though this book is not strictly autobi autobiographical, prose poems, fiction, uh, lyric <laughs> essays, fiction, my mom is listening. And, uh, but it's nice to be able to incorporate a lot of these places because these places are a part of me. You know, even though I, I would never claim to, I was telling someone, it's like, like I would never lead the, the protest march. If it's your protest march, I wouldn't lead your protest march, but I can be there in the background, you know? And so yeah. like, oh, like this painting is from uh, the Southern part of uh, Nepal. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of Nepali art actually. 
Uh, but but I, I don't know. It's hmm, I'm trying to think. What do I say about place? Uh, so so I have one piece called Dreams of the Diaspora, and that is exists digitally at the Smithsonian uh, Asian Pacific American Center. And I wrote that with a friend who is uh, Bangladeshi, and it's a conversation between. Uh, an immigrant and the child of immigrants about who has it worse. And, uh, but it, it's, what it was, was the way it started, the Smithsonian was doing an exhibition about Indian Americans. And it was the first time that Indian Americans had been presented in the Smithsonian. And so they, but they realized they didn't have any art about the H-1B visa. So they put out a call for art related to the H-1B visa. Now this never happens. The Smithsonian never puts out a call for anything, but they said whoever wins, you know, first place basically, they didn't call it that, but the best one they would put in the Smithsonian and then all the others, the runners up, so to speak, would be in a digital uh, archive. Mm -hmm. And I was working with a, a photographer uh, and I said, well, we will never win first place because we're not a sculptor or a painter mm -hmm. or or someone who and neither of us are actually indian but we do have a connection to to um you know south asia and we are able to tell a broader story of immigration and so we aimed for second place mm -hmm. and we created this multimedia uh <clears throat> digital piece that has you know it's poetry and it's photography and there's a soundscape and there's spoken word and it it explores you know kind of childhood issues you know citizenship you know passing the citizenship test issues getting through tsa as a person of color issues and and what does it mean you know to feel home right what does the diaspora dream about and where is home where do you feel mm -hmm. You know what? What does it feel like home? And of course, the dreaded question: Where are you from? No. Where are you, where really, are you really from? from? Right. <laughs> and I'm actually doing a, a literary reading tomorrow at Michigan in Michigan to celebrate 100, 150 years of Asian Americans in Michigan, uh, and that's the title of our of our uh, literary reading. That's great. Well, it, as you know, I am from Ann Arbor because I was born there. So <laughs> I lived in Michigan for the first 18 months of my life. So I claim it. Um, so speaking of multimedia and sort of mixed genre, which you really love to do, and I appreciate how much you play with genre and bridge those, those boundaries. I'd love for you to sh talk about some of the pieces that began as artwork. And um, if we could get the slides on screen to, to have a conversation about some of these, um, the, the essays and the poems that began or were inspired by a piece of artwork. Um, if Maurice, you could share the screen, the slides, that would be great. <clears throat> which actually we'll come back to at the end as well. Well, there it is. So, um, so the Asian American Women's Artists Association is a national organization, but based in San Francisco, mostly based in San Francisco. They have an art show every two years. And what they asked, and there was a, they had a literary reading and the great, writer Mei Li Chai, uh, novelist, essayist. Uh, she asked me to be a part of this reading uh, because they wanted it to be not just a local reading, but a national reading. And so what she asked people to do is she, they had already had the artwork that was gonna be in the show. There's an art exhibition by Asian American women. And she had um, the photographs and she asked us to look at the artwork, find a piece that resonates with you and then write a reaction to it. And so I found this artwork, this is not the original ones, but it's in the same uh, realm of them by Stella Zhang. And it's just like these, you know, in, in a blunt form, they're like these big soft cushy pillows, but they're full of these spiky toothpicks yes. and they're all in different shapes. And, and they're really, you know, and, and then I was looking at them and, and I don't know a lot about visual art. So, 
I feel very much like an imposter in this world. But I looked at those and I said, you know, they're so spiky like little porcupines. That reminds me of someone I know. <laughs> and so I wrote this piece based on, you know, this fight I was having with someone. A lot of my poems are fights with somebody. So, uh, and then I went, I performed it there and it was so much fun because the artist was there at the reading and at the end, like her face was so, she's like, I had never thought about my work in that way because she had a totally different uh, thinking about it, but it was nice to bring it together. That's great. But, it's yeah. so compelling too. The the it feels it feels really like you could reach out and touch it, but maybe you might not want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was a. Oh yeah, it starts off with oh you are so prickly, you know I'm ready to throttle you constantly, right? So it starts off in in the middle of the fight, and it it pretty much is yeah. That's a lot of my that's my world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great and then and then so that was I think that was one of the first art exhibitions that AAWAA did and then two years later they had another art exhibition this one I think was on the, the theme of uh, food and mainly Chai again organized a literary reading and asked me to be a part of it and I saw this and this artwork uh, by Jung Ron is a teetering stack of teacups that she has made. And then mm. along the wall are um, tea bags that have been ripped open, but they're the kind of tea bags that have like a little fortune on it. Um, I don't know what, but it's one particular brand, right? There's a little, instead there's a little fortune mm -hmm. on it. And so I, based on that piece, I, I, you know, I, I thought about how at the time I was feeling like I was teetering like a stack of teacups, I felt a little wobbly. And so I, I wrote that. And then also I wanted to add in a lot of my pieces, they're, they're set into the, the current events of the time because I'm a writer, because I'm a journalist, right? I'm oftentimes I'm writing about these different, you know, news events and as, and also as a journalist, I, I cover Asian American issues that my whole career has been covering Asian America. So I'm immersed in these Asian American news events but i can't always write about them in you know the in the media format so i need another place to put that you know that anxiety or those stories or those um you know kind of emotional reaction to it and so at the time that i wrote this the, the sri racha factory in Los, in southern california was closed because they were in a fight with city council and there was some concern in the Asian American community. What if they can't resolve this? What if they can't open the factory again? What if there's no more Sri Racha? <laughs> and so Asian Americans across the country started hoarding Sri Racha, <laughs> ourselves included. And so that's why there's the Sri Racha apocalypse uh, piece in it. Oh, but, that's uh, hysterical. Yeah. So, oh, and then sewing aunties. So this, again, with Asian American Women Art Association, this is my chance to be a part of it. And so in the last few years, I've been searching for a new genre, right? I kind of, you know, just like essays. I've been writing essays for a long time. So what else can I do? Then I wrote prose poetry, three chapbooks and a, and a book. And I wanted to try to, you know, figure out a new genre, you know, mm -hmm. is it photography? I'm not a very good photographer. It can't be paint or drawing because I cannot draw to save my life. And then uh, maybe pottery, uh, I really, not. I oh, I took a pottery class in grad school. I made like an ashtray. Um, out of six weeks, I made one ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know anyone who smokes. So, um, well, so then, um, and then uh, one of my aunts passed away and I was, and she, she lives here in this town and my cousin lives in a different state. So I was, ended up cleaning her house. And every time I, you know, opened another cupboard, I would find another tofu container. Mm -hmm. I'd find another stone. I'd find all these things. And I also found 
all these amazing tools that she had created, that she had taken from other things and repurposed and created, you know, tools that were specific. You could tell it had a very specific function, you know, knives that had things right. strapped to them and forks mm -hmm. that had things, you know, I don't know what the, it was, but clearly it had one particular function. So I, I, thought, you know, and then I learned a little bit about art installation. I'm like, maybe this could be my genre. And so I, as an experiment, I created these art installations with, um, um, can we Repurpose. show the next slide? You can see it a little clear on the next slide. Yeah. So these are um, found objects mm -hmm. and I put them together. And the theme for this art exhibition was about environmentalism. And so I thought, well, how do we you know, for immigrants and the children of immigrants and probably even the child, the third gen too, like we reuse before that was a word, right? We don't we throw upcycle. anything away. <laughs> yeah, upcycle before that word was created. You know, you know, hoarding is kind of a problem for us. Uh, like when Marie Kondo was, was popular, all the Asian Americans are like, no, I cannot do this. This is not me. And then, but then we say, oh, it's because you know, of intergenerational trauma. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so I'm experimenting with, with art installation and I love it. I really find it. My kids are completely unimpressed. They're like, that is not art. That is trash. You're just putting <laughs> trash together in an artful form. That doesn't count. And then, um, but I just got this piece accepted at another art show uh, at Mattai Botanical Gardens in Ann Arbor for their 100th anniversary. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So the next few slides are just close-ups <clears throat> of the same pieces so we can go through the close rest. And it's so interesting because this, um, the one with the, I don't know if that's in here, but the butter cookies that oh, dance. Yes, this yes it is in there. Um, this actually, my grandmother who is white from the Midwest, um, had always used that Royal Dansk mm -hmm. Uh, for for container for containing other things rather than butter cookies, so right, right. And it I has to be royal dance too. Yes, yes, <laughs> that resonated with me. I love it. Yeah, a lot of people always say, "Oh, a box of cookies, great," and then they open it up, sewing supplies. Yep, oh. very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so it may just be a, it may also be a thrifty Midwestern thing as well as for I immigrants. Think, <laughs> I think so, and it 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 you know boggles the mind sometimes like when I first found out and this is in this in this poem that there are some people who like take the the rubber bands off the green onions and throw them away and then they go to office max and they buy rubber bands and that's supposed to be better because you're buying them new like, <laughs> that doesn't even make sense to me I don't know why people would yes, do that yes well, that's wonderful. Yeah. I love all of the all of the found objects and reuses. And we have to talk about the yellow dildo. It's not a yellow dildo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a yellow dildo. And so tell a little bit of the story without giving it away for people who are going to read the book. OK, so uh, when my youngest was in preschool, he love bananas but you know if you take bananas in your lunch they always turn brown and they always get battered and bruised and it's impossible to have a banana in your lunch right so no one takes bananas for lunch one day at lunch at preschool uh i saw this japanese boy uh or his mom was from japan actually he's a multiracial boy his mom was from japan and he had a banana in one of these yellow plastic containers with holes in it and the holes allow it to breathe so it doesn't turn brown and the plastic keeps it you know safe from being from getting bruised and, right, and I'm like right. what is this this is the most amazing invention ever and I looked for years I couldn't find them in America because they were only made in Japan and then I went to a conference I think it was, oh the v3 conference it used to be an Asian American uh, journalist conference in LA and uh, there was a group uh, let's see, they used to be called Bicoastal Bitchin, and then they were, they started a new website, uh, web project called yellowdildo.com, and it was to explore Asian American sexuality, but as their swag, they were giving away these, these plastic banana, 
banana holders or banana cases uh, with their URL wrapped around the middle. And when I saw it, I'm like, oh, then I'm so excited. Um, you know, and I was like, I'm, I'm at a conference. I'm trying to be cool. I'm kind of a <laughs> digital media person. And as soon as I see it, I completely revert back to someone's mom. And I'm like, oh, I was so excited to have it. <laughs> and then I brought it home. And the kids thought it was hysterical because, of course, it had, you know, it said yellowdildo.com wrapped around the middle. And ever, suddenly they all want to have bananas for lunch. And I'm like, <laughs> to the high schoolers, I'm like, okay, okay, but please do not get this confiscated. I do not want to have to be called into the office. I don't want to have to explain to a teacher. And the, they were cool about it. But the girls were making such a fuss that the little boy was really, um, really confused, right? He knew, because they kept saying it's a bad word, it's a bad word. And so he knew it was a bad word, but he couldn't read yet. So he decided that it must say, oh, I know, the girls told him it said yellow duck. Right, right. And, and, uh, and this is because they their logo wasn't like a, a duck. It kind of like a kind of looked kind of like the Twitter bird, but not exactly. This is early days before Twitter. And and so we told him it was yellowduck.com. And after a few days, he came back to me. He goes, I know it doesn't say yellowduck.com because it's a bad word. And he whispered it. He couldn't even say it, but he figured out that it must say yellow dumb because dumb is not a word that we right. allow in our house. Oh and word. he was so, you know, and I'm like, but he couldn't even say it because it was such a bad word. And so I'm like, yeah, that's a bad word. Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> But uh, and well, then, thank you for the slides. That's wonderful. <clears throat> that's a, that's all the slides we're going to show. That's, yeah, that's great. So, um, yeah, and 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 to hear the end of the story and all the things that happened to the yellow not dildo, the yellow banana case. You need to read the book because yeah. there's a little bit more that ensues. <laughs> yeah, and it's inspired by you know it, it is not a, yes the you know, fictional the, the fictional, fictional version. <laughs> Please don't sue me. And uh, so inspired. <clears throat> it's, it's poetry. It's, yes. It's yes. Inspired so, by that original story. Yes. <laughs> and you um, you use the second person often, which I really appreciate. I have one editor who doesn't let me use second person. And it's helped me realize how much I appreciate being able to. But I, as I was reading your book, I, won I started wondering, who is the you? Because initially I was thinking it was your love interest. And then I thought maybe it's the reader or maybe it's you. Maybe you're writing to yourself. And so I was curious, who is you in Cannot Resist Me When My Hair Is in Braids? Interesting. It's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's me. I think it's someone else. Uh, and, and usually it's because, like I said, I'm trying to figure things out. And I write a lot of letters. And uh, this is a trick, a writing trick, if we're going to be talking about writers. Um, like, uh, <clears throat> and this is, this is like, when I was a columnist, a lot of my columns started off as letters, as emails to people. And I'd be like, dear so-and-so, you won't, you'll never guess what happened today. Mm. Today we did this and we went here and we had a great time. And I just, it just be like a little newsy letter. And then after about two days, I would say, hey, you know, that letter I wrote, that would be a good column. And so then I'd go back and I'd recapture the email and then kind of generalize it a little bit and turn it into a column. And so a lot of my writing, and as a trick, a writing trick, whenever you're stuck, write dear so-and-so at the top of the page and tell one person that story, you know, that you want to tell. Because telling the world, whoever that is, or the whole world, you know, millions of people is impossible. Mm -hmm. But if you have one trusted friend that you want to tell this story to, that's easy because you know that one person. And mm -hmm. whether that, yeah. And so that's that's how a lot of these started. Uh, one is me trying to figure out how do I feel about this person who mm -hmm. I'm probably having a fight with uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> or am frustrated with in some way. And uh trying to figure out how do I feel about this and do I want to be here? Do I not want to be here? Where is this going? And that's, that's how I, I figured out in, in conversation, in, literally in conversation. Yeah, right, right. 
Well, as the saying goes, you know, don't pick a fight with someone who buys ink by the barrel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So um, would you like to read a passage? I have a couple more questions, but I also wanted to just give you an opportunity sure. to read something. What would you like me to read? Um, oh my gosh, there's so many parts that I love. I Some of my favorite are towards the end. Um, I think there's just some wonderful language, but uh, all, anything. Oh, so do you want to, how about sewing aunties? Sure. We can do, um, we'll do one little section of it. This I think folks will relate to, just because we lo just looked at all those pictures. Yes. So this is just a, a, a a section of it. At any auntie's home, the world comes full circle. Shoes off at the door, stacks of tofu containers by the kitchen sink, green onion rubber bands looped on the faucet, plastic bags full of plastic bags, kitchen towels sewn from rice bags, twist ties in the chopstick drawer, giant soy sauce can under the sink, Big detergent containers and cardboard boxes carefully cut into new shapes for new purposes. Old children's toys transformed into tools couched in memory. Have you eaten yet? Nietzsche Fanama as code. Auntie greets me wearing a blue monkey aeropostal sweatshirt I remember my cousin wearing in the 90s. We eat from plastic Hello Kitty bowls and plates, the same ones we used when I was small. The secret cupboard full of candy and red envelopes is still stocked, I checked. When she sees a tear in the knee of my jeans, she tells me to go fetch her cookie tin so she can mend it. She lets me go shopping in her closet. She sends me home with a po huge pile of leftovers packaged in a variety of plastic, pla in a variety of plastic takeout containers and vegetables from her garden wrapped in last week's Chinese newspaper. Auntie does not think in environmental terms. She does not calculate the economics of her garden, full of the flavors of home that she cannot buy from jiu cai to persimmon trees. She fertilizes with eggshells and tea leaves and her garage is full of, her garage is full of dried seeds for next year. Despite a long successful career in America, she still does not buy anything full price. When I buy her a CSA for the quarantine so that she does not have to go to the grocery store so often, she complains that $16 a week for vegetables is too expensive. Auntie fights with the heron who hovers by her pond. Those are my fish, not the bird's fish. I love it. I love it. So many, so many resonant moments. Thank you, Francis. Oh, thank you. Um, and I, that's a light, a more lighthearted, um, really visual poem. Um, and, and so many other pieces in this book are really hard, you know, sort of full of the pain, the frustration, the conflict, you know, um, or heartbreak. And yet, um, you know, it's a funny. You have you're a funny writer. You have a great sense of wit and 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 humor. And I think, especially through the course of the book, it really ends on a optimistic note. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that. You know, how you navigate the world and 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 finding that humor. Um, yeah, that's that's. I'm so glad you think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> The reviewers even know. said so. Someone oh. said something about your keen wit and your deft uh, oh. navigation. Thanks. Um, this is another one of the lessons from my um, writing classes that I teach at the community college. Uh, they say that to be a good writer, you need to be a good reader. And I have this very kind of, you know, what do you call self-important feeling of what kind of writing that I like. Like I like literary writing. I like these, you know, great novels with these big words and stuff. And and you know, like I like I love Michael and Donchi, but when his new book came out, I got it from the library. It was sat by my bed. It sat there for a few months before I got around to reading it. And so what do I actually spend my time reading? I I love BuzzFeed. 
<laughs> articles, <laughs> you know, like funny articles. That's where I actually spend my time. And then I really had to reevaluate, oh, maybe I don't like the kind of uh, reading that I think I do. Maybe yeah. I can write a little different too because I don't think I'm funny I remember I had got in a I was at a poetry reading once and everyone kept laughing and I was asking my friend but why why is this funny and they thought I was joking they're like oh you're so funny I'm like no really I don't know <laughs> and they wouldn't tell me mm. so uh I'm, I'm glad it's it's funny I love wow. it uh, I love it um another thing that uh, also resonated for me is um this tenuous relationship that you know you have with the sort of role of artist and we even talked about it before sort of needing permission or needing a name to be able to claim a genre and you know i'm someone who began my career as a daily journalist right so it's taken me some time to embrace the identity of author you know not just someone who's stitching together quotes or a craftsperson who's pulling together information and i can i can actually pinpoint the week that when my identity started to shift to include artist. Um, and I'd love to, and I and I consider you an artist. I consider you a funny writer and an artist. So you know, Francis. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, can you talk about your own journey and sort of your relationship with this sort of artist and doing art and what it took for you to just say, yeah, I can do this too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my friends are very patient with me. <laughs> so when I first, when I wrote this first chapbook, Imaginary Affairs, Postcards from an Imagined Life, uh, my I have a friend who's an English professor and she loved it. And I'm like, really? Is this <laughs> literature? Is this really literature? And she said, yes, it is. I'm like, are you sure? And then, you know, like uh, in, in this book, there's a, uh, there's a, a collaborative poem that I write with the poet Ravi Shankar. Mm -hmm. Oh, who's from the, in the Virginia area originally. But um, every time I, I send him a poem, I'm like, is this poetry? Are you sure? Is this really poetry? He's a professional poet. He should know. Uh, and so I, I have a lot of doubts. Uh, you know, I like, I'm not really sure about, you know, even when I write something, it's like, is is this good? Is it not good? Is this a story? I, I sometimes sometimes you're too close and you don't know. Yeah. But now I seem to have been hitting home long enough that I, I have a little more confidence in it. And also, you know what's good? I actually teach this in my writing classes, uh, Julia Cameron, Artist's Way. And she says that we all have an inner artist inside of us, but it's kind of been beaten down by society and our family and friends who love us, but because they love us, they want us to be safe and to have a, you know, and have a safe job like an accountant right. or a lawyer or an engineer. Nobody wants, you know, their kids to be an artist. I'm an artist and I don't even want my kids to be an artist, right? I'm very happy that all my kids are in the sciences. <laughs> relieved is probably the better word. I am completely relieved that all my kids are scientists, but they also, and then now that they're safely in the sciences, it's it's being revealed that they also have these little artistic sides. Like they do, you know, they go to little painting classes or they go to little pottery classes. And I, you know, it, I'm so happy that they can do that. And so I think being able to call myself an artist, this really only came recently i think at some point i uh, oh at some point i i gave up on you know i'm like well you know i gave up on being a journalist i came back to it but at the time i gave up on being a journalist mm -hmm. like, this is, this industry is not going to work oh, you yeah. know maybe i'll i'll try this artist path and write some grants i got some grants and i wrote some things and and i was having a great time and uh, and then I started calling myself an artist, and other people start calling me an artist, and so yeah. So I, it was a slow process. It's taken a long time for me to feel confident being able to say that. I love um, that. Well, yeah. you know, and it's taken me some time to be able to call myself Asian American. You know, I Aww. used to say I'm half Asian, half white, and then I realized I'm a whole person. I'm mm -hmm. not pieces, you know, stitched together, and. 
sometimes we need to just name it, right? In a conversation about words, I think it's fair to say, sometimes you just need to say it and, and will it into being. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, kind of become, you know, same thing, my Asian Americanness took, took time. It took time to come through. And a lot of it was with raising the kids and kind of yeah. teaching them and learning along the way with them and being on this journey together with all of them. Well, I would love to, if we have time for a very short passage, can you read page 82? And, and we'll let the audience judge because I think this is art um, with a capital A, um, you know, maybe just from the, either the, the break, the first break or just above the first break. Oh, this one. I love that page. Oh, really? Okay. So where on, so 82, the, the second yeah. section? Yeah. Oh, I love doing these readings. Everyone picks up on different passages. So you're the first <laughs> one to pick out this poem. Uh, page 82, second to last section. And this is called The Space Between Goodbye. Um, the next morning, the moment over, I go back to work and life, distracted. We've said goodbye and he is gone. And I assume that that is it. I have no expectations. It was only a kiss. But then he calls and he writes and he sends me a song. He sends me a song and I find myself growing fond of him. I try not to read too much into any of it. I try not to think too far ahead. I try to protect him from what he doesn't yet know about me. I try to linger. And in the quiet before goodbye, I sing his song. Beautiful. Francis, thank you so much for this conversation, for the honor of, of talking to you about this wonderful book. Um, huge thanks to the DC Public Library for, for inviting me to, to participate. Mm -hmm. I hope you all will check this out literally from the library. And, um, and you know, you can find Francis on the internet everywhere. Francis Kaihua Wong, really a pleasure to connect with you and talk with you. And thank you again to the to the library for, for convening this conversation. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Uh, and thank you, thank you, MLK Library. I love librarians. <laughs>